um, your um, experience of COVID is going to be very different to other people. And that's why I want, you know, I want to tailor the content when I do go to do it. I'll introduce at the end the content for the three sessions. But like I said in the little introductory clip that I did, um, I'm really open and I love interacting, getting feedback and, and tailoring and keeping things really specific. I probably learned stuff this evening from yourselves. So um, I like also, um, I was saying to Sam and Ula earlier, I love interacting. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free. Uh, if there's something I say that you don't understand, you don't get, you know, put up your hand to be like school waving and whatever. And I'm not terribly okay with Zoom. So please feel free to say, uh, you know, if you need to interrupt or ask me to go over something, or if you have something you want to ask or bring up, please, you know, feel free. I love questions and um, uh, interaction of any kind. So um, is that okay with everybody? Are we all ready to, to get stuck in? Um, there's nothing very complicated in CBT. That's another thing we can kind of think of, you know, psychology and the mind a bit like, um, Voodoo or kind of, you know, it's not, it's, it's really normal. It's lots of very interesting stuff. I'm a bit of a brain nerd. I, I just find all this stuff fascinating. So hopefully you'll find something interesting in here this evening and come back and join us again for the, the three part where we we'll get into, we we'll get stuck into the, the good stuff. So first of all, just as a general introduction, what is CBT? Uh, it's collaborative. So uh, the client and I uh, would work together um, I know CBT, but they know themselves in the same way you as a CF community, you, you know far more about your own particular needs uh, than I do. So that's why I love to get information back. Um, it works by teaching clients how to become their own therapist, which I love. Um, I supply resources when I'm working with people. So at the end of a client coming to me, they have like a folder of resources that they can pull out and use for anything. Um, like in a lot of my clients that I was working with back in January, February, March, when it came to COVID, they were very well prepared. They found it, you know, they were much better able to, able to take uh, the resources we had been doing and the skills we'd been working on, uh, you know, which obviously weren't for COVID, stress or anxiety, low mood, you know, they'd be typical um, issues that I would work with and just transfer them. So anything that we do in the, the three workshops will be particular to COVID but they will also, you know, um, transfer to anything around your partner, uh, you know, perhaps with a colleague, you know, whatever, those kind of things, daily stresses. Um, so it is, uh, you know, really transferable and it's a good broad um, set of, of techniques to use. So loads of people, it's a bit of a buzzword, CBT, everybody kind of reaches for it and lots of uh, therapists like to tag it on. Not everybody has done the full training. So if any of you do ever go, uh, in quest of CBT, please ask the person how many days training they've done because some people will do a weekend, a couple of days, like for I've done two years. So just as a protective for yourselves. So we're trying to overcome and change unhelpful patterns of thoughts and behaviors. They're the two aspects that we come at it from. So you can see there's a bit of a loop there. Uh, every all of these areas interact, uh, you know, in a cycle. So we get uh, physical symptoms, we get emotional feelings. We get uh, behaviors and then thoughts. Thoughts are a big part of CBT. Why would you go for CBT? CBT is about helping people thrive. It's about helping people reach their everyday potential. Um, a lot of uh, issues, people, there's a lot, I think as Irish people, we're not great at kind of complimenting ourselves. And, you know, um, in America, they would, you know, if somebody does good and you say, oh, you did really well, an American person says, yeah, I did fantastic. And if you say to an Irish person, you did well, they will often kind of brush it off and bashful. So um, in CBT, we're trying to help people realize, you know, what's, what are your potentials and can we help you reach them? But uh, within that, not everybody's potentials are the same. And it's weird using the word potential in the plural because everybody has different talents and areas that they're good at. Um, and can we bring it out, that's what we're aiming to do in CBT. And this is a really old cartoon um, where if you line everybody up and ask them to do the same thing, that's not a good idea. That's not like a fair selection. So just to be aware, everybody's context is different. Everybody's background is different. So, um, and again, I think COVID is, is throwing that up. You know, there's lots of people saying, oh, we're all in the same boat. And yes, we're all going through the same 
COVID, but it's different for everybody. Everybody's resources are not the same. Everybody's background is not the same. Everybody's playing field isn't level. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. So that's why it's really important when we're looking uh, at ourselves in the situations that we're in is not to compare with other people or other situations. So because is everything you're comparing identical? Um, this is a lovely little cartoon that I like because it just shows, you know, two people can go through the exact same situation and have a completely different experience of it. And it's not that either person is good or bad. It's just that their um, experience is different. Uh, their backgrounds are different. Their environment might be different. Um, their experience, their resources. So all of this, uh, all of these um, factors are really important to take into consideration. So what kind of things fuel me? What shapes me? And there's four different areas within that. And I'll kind of, as I'm going through the presentation, I'll refer to each of these. So how am I? We're very caught up with the question, why? Why do I do this? Why did I do that? And that can kind of turn into a stick that we beat ourselves with where we're very inclined to be self-critical. Whereas a question like how is much more curious, it's more open-ended, um, and it, it tends to be less critical. So what kind of things in terms of fuel, um, what am I nourishing myself with? What am I feeding myself in lots of different ways? And I'll explain that. Um, what's my environment like? Everybody's environment is different. Uh, your current environment, what we're living in right now, say in COVID as a nation, the house that you're living in, the body that you're living in. So all our environments are very different. And we're inclined, again, when it comes to comparisons, we're inclined to forget that. We're inclined to forget that there's a context or a bigger picture. And that's a really important um, element to take into consideration when we're thinking about well-being and mental health. And I'll come back to that. Uh, our actions, things that we do, uh, our interactions, our behaviors, things that we get up to uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, things that we uh, engage in, they affect how we are on a day-to-day -day basis. And then our thoughts, how we think, how we perceive things. We, you know, again, going back to, you can have two people looking at the same thing. Has anyone ever seen that little cartoon where it's a guy in a prison cell and he's looking out, he's drawing a painting. There's the two guys in the prison cells are drawing paintings. One guy's looking at, he's looking at the sky. So he paints a beautiful uh, scene of the sky because the other guy paints the bars that they're looking through. So it's that idea of perspective and how we see things, how we think about things is really important. So I'll, that's a, one of the biggest areas that I work with in clients is tackling thinking. A lot of the time our thinking isn't uh, healthy, it isn't helpful. So uh, again, our environment has an awful lot to play uh, with that. So I'll, they're the kind of areas that we'll be looking at as I'm talking. Um, okay, so as I'm talking there about thinking, you know, thoughts are how we make decisions. It's they're how we, get, you know, get up out of bed and they, they're going in our heads all day long. But what is a thought? And it's something that we don't know an awful lot about. So basically, a thought is a neuron firing. It's a chemical that happens uh, in the brain. And depending on where it happens in the brain, uh, will play a lot, tell a lot about uh, the thought. Basically, it's like a mental part. And when I would do, I do presentations even in primary schools, well, I used to, uh, you know, kids, oh, she's a part. But it's often, has, has any of you had the experience where you think something, so, oh, I must, you know, that's really important. Now, I even had a client uh, who said, oh, I said yesterday, now I'm going to tell Neve about that and that, whatever. And then when they came in, literally 24 hours later, they couldn't remember what it was that they were going to tell me. So a lot of the time, our thoughts are just fleeting. They just come in, go away, and the le sometimes the less attention that we pay to thoughts, the better. And a really, really important question, particularly now in this um, COVID you know, scenario, there's so much news, there's so much information, there's you know, people with theories and people not sticking to rules and people who do, you know, it can be mind boggling. But a really important question is, are thoughts always true? So just even think about that because we are inclined to react as if they are. We tend to go along with our thoughts. Negative predictions 
we tend to pay much more attention to. And there is a physiological, like a, you know, a part of our evolution. If you think about the human race, like why, how are we here? How did we get to this point? How have we survived? And one of the things that keeps us alive is our being aware of threat and danger, reacting quickly to it and surviving um, and escaping risk. So we're predisposed, we're wired to pay attention to negative situations. And actually we um, process negative information seven times faster than we do uh, good information. And if you think about that for a minute, you go, well, why is that? No, these are microseconds. It's really, really fast, the, the way everything works in our brains. But, you know, a good, good news or a good situation or a nice situation is not going to harm us. It doesn't put us in danger. So it's not as, as important to pay attention to it. Whereas something that could harm us, boom, we're on it. So be aware and think about your thinking. Is this you know, is this true? Am I paying more attention to it because it has an element of danger or risk, which we're predisposed to? It's not our fault that that's how we think. And then positive predictions we pay less attention to because from a survival point of view, they're less important. Okay, so stress. Everybody is stressed at the moment with COVID. So what is it? It's our emotional so in our feelings, how we feel about things uh, and physical response, we feel it in our bodies as well. Um, when we, sorry, no, I can't. <laughs> I'm trying to minimize this life when it comes up in front of my stuff. When we feel there's too many demands and too few resources to cope, that puts us under pressure. So it's kind of like, you know, a weighing scales. It's a balance that we're trying to, uh, you know, keep, uh, I wonder is sorry now it's just the slide has stopped working it just um I wonder is it because the poll is up I can't move on Lula, maybe but just there's a physical balancing act almost needs to go on when we're thinking about stress if you have loads of demands but you go yeah I'm well able that's, you know, the scales would stay the same. So that's not a physical problem. That's not a, a problem resulting in stress. If you have very few resources, but there's very few demands, that's not, you're not going to be stressed there either. But currently there's a lot of demands. We're being asked to do an awful lot. We're being asked to give up an awful lot. And we're not sure about resources. Um, and, you know, populations that have underlying issues, there's a lot of uncertainty and, you know, are we going to be looked after? So that will put the, the scales out of kilter uh, and cause probably stress. Um, Nuna, can you see the response there to the uh, poll? Oh, there we go. So that just, I want to kind of a visual as well for people to remember about stress. So demands and resources, am I trying to keep the two and this, this is something that I look at in a lot of detail in the first workshop how do we manage demands and how do we improve our resources so there are two things so yeah so 87 percent no surprise um yeah particularly with anybody with you know because every news and oh, underlying condition that keeps being referred to us so it would be very very hard to not and that's another thing just to say um it's absolutely normal that people are stressed. When I'm working with clients at the moment, I'm being very careful when they're reporting low mood or when they're reporting stress or anxiety to tease out, is this COVID related? Because if it is COVID related, that's normal. And you wouldn't be like trying to undo that because it's an appropriate response. So the stress that everybody's feeling right now is normal um, and to be expected. And it's a healthy, physiological response that we recognize there's an awful lot being asked of us we don't think maybe that we have the resources hopefully by doing the three workshops that will help improve the resources and ease that sense of stress and pressure so what's a typical cycle of stress stress and anxiety and low mood tend to operate in loops so you get a thought first of all something like I can't deal with all of this. Is that, would that be a familiar uh, thought to people? And that evokes them, you start to feel. 
Has anyone ever noticed or thinking, uh, anyone been studying or doing exams, I thought of something that I had to do and I had forgotten to do yesterday. And I instantly got not in my stomach. Like it was so fast. Like our bodies respond really, really quickly to when we think something almost kind of before, often we can be aware of what we're thinking. Like I can't deal with all this. You might respond then, you might get tense, you might get a headache, you might have a knot in your stomach. My stomach is my kind of, that's my first sign. Uh, you might be distracted, your head, you know, get kind of all over the place. The effect then that that might have on you is you might have difficulty concentrating. Um, you might start things. I'm a devil for doing this. I'll start something and think, oh yeah, and I'm interested. Oh yeah, I know, yeah. And the other way, like 17 tabs open on your laptop and it might you might get to the end of the day and nothing is finished. So you might go, oh, geez, I'm working all day and have nothing done. And you're dismissing the fact that you've been making lots of effort, but because you can't see a task completed, you're saying I've done nothing. Then that, you know, you get that feeling then of, um, I, you know, giving out yourself, um, I've achieved nothing. And that just goes to kind of consolidate or strengthen the thought, I can't deal with that. So we get caught in these loops of stress and anxiety. And in CBT, we try and kind of hook in, we try and cut in somewhere in any, we can come in on the thought, we can come in on the emotions, we can come in on the physiology, the feelings, uh, or we can come in on the behaviors. So it gives us lots of options uh, in how we can uh, address. And everyone is different. As I'm even saying this, some of you will be going, oh yeah, I think like that a lot. Or some of you might be going, oh yeah, I feel like that a lot. So everybody is different and you'll all take different things out of this and you'll end up with your kind of individual take on what I'm presenting. There's lots of information and it's about personalizing it for your own use. Okay, so what kind of things do we think? There's a, a, a behavior that we can get involved in uh, called cognitive distortions where we kind of distort information that uh, we're used to seeing. So these are some ideas of like, when I'm working with clients, I would give them this list. And if anyone wants any of these worksheets, by the way, I, you can uh, email me or, or I'll send them on to the girls and they can pass them on to you. Um, you know, please use me as a resource um, or, or a guide to what's good and not so good resources because often that can be a uh, tricky minefield. So back to this, this is unhelpful. Uh, thinking habits, what I would call with clients thinking sins. So, for example, um, at the moment, uh, mental filter, the first one there, um, to give you an idea. Okay, I send all of you, I give all of you 100 euro, and I say, go out and buy something, please, for 100 euro. I want you to go to 10 different shops and buy uh, 10 things for your spending spree. And you go to 10 shops, and you meet in the nine of the shops, you meet lovely um, person behind the counter, you have a bit of chat. You get on really well, you know, it's really nice and you get your thing and you come away. But in the 10th shop, there's some old bitty behind the counter and she's not in good form and she sees you coming and she's not up or she's quite, you know, it's not a nice interaction. She's grumpy. She accuses you of giving you the wrong money. It's a big row. You end up storming out and then you come back to me and I go, well, how did you get on? What are you going to tell me about? you know and you, you'd be that's you know and that's what we zone in on and what happens to your mood when you're thinking about her you're getting cross you're getting irritated or you're annoyed you're upset so that's a mental filter where we zone in and again think of primitive brain zoning in on the negative that's its purpose you're not doing that deliberately that's a kind of a wiring primitive wiring thing and what has happened to the other nine that were lovely, the other nice nine people, they're gone. Then my granny used to say, where's the snow that fell last Christmas? So we forget, we don't pay as much attention to good stuff because we don't have to. So that's an interesting sheet to have a look at and think about like emotional reasoning it might be something I feel bad. And maybe when your condition is flaring, you might feel physically well and you might you know, that may link into how you see things that when you're feeling physically better, you'll be better able to deal with. So emotional reasoning can play on our minds as well. Mind reading. 
uh, we're devils for that in this country. Oh, what will they think? Oh, what will people say? Or thinking, oh, they'll think I'm, you know, if you make a mistake, they'll think I'm stupid. So mind reading is another kind of thinking sin that we can engage in. Critical self, see it there with the thumbs down. If self-criticism worked, uh, I would be out of job as a therapist because uh, so many people engage in it. Uh, we think we're doing well, we think we're kind of egging ourselves on, but in fact, we just make ourselves feel worse. And any of you, if you think for a minute, think about the last time you gave out to yourself, you make a mistake, oh, jeez, couldn't do anything right. And you know that kind of tone? It's kind of nasty and toxic. Mm -hmm. And if you heard anybody else speaking like that to somebody, you would probably stop them. So these are thinking habits to be aware of. So um, if I can send this on to anyone and have a think about what are your typical thinking uh, sins. Um, okay, so there's an interesting question. How many of these habits are familiar as your own behavior? So um, like there's another one, mountains and molehills kind of like black and white thinking. Any of you know anybody, even if it's not yourselves, somebody who is like, oh, fantastic, or no, not so good. Um, catastrophizing, a lot of people are catastrophizing. Um, at the very beginning, there was a lot of catastrophizing, people going, oh my God, this is going to be appalling, the whole country is going to be shut down forever, or every business is going to collapse, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are going to get sick. You know, so there was a, a very, oh, you know, an overestimation again, of negative news so we're zoning in we're drawn to the negative and then we're inclined not to know what to do with it so we will go our brain will go to the worst case scenario thinking it's helping us prepare but not really it just brings up that sensation of stress so um, that's something to keep in mind shoulds and musts are you putting yourself under pressure memories if you've had difficult experiences in the past and you're going oh because that was terrible then this would be terrible now. And in fact, they could be two different things. So keep in mind uh, when you're thinking, oh, hang on a second now, that's the mental filter your one was talking about. Oh yeah, okay, I need to think of the whole picture. So that can be a really good way of keeping our thoughts in check, keeping an eye on them. So rational and irrational. Previously before this, um, I remember watching, anyone watch the movie Pandemic? I mean, talk about it, <laughs> predictive. It's exactly, you know, what we're going through at the moment. And if you'd watched that, you would have said, you know, 10 years ago when it came out, it was not, that's never going to happen. And we would have been accused of thinking irrationally. So, our, you know, but not every thought that we think, not every negative thought is wrong. It's not always incorrect. So when, if you thought, think a thought that matches reality, that's a rational thought, but if your thought doesn't match reality, it's an irrational. And that can be really helpful to know the difference. Is my thinking, you know, real? Is, am I talking about an, a real situation or is it a hypothetical situation? Um, a good clue to this is what if, you know, what if something terrible happens? What if, and again, that goes back to catastrophizing. Um, the what ifing, you're bringing up troubles and problems in your mind that your mind will respond to and your body will respond to that is they're almost impossible to do anything about. So they tend to be exhausting and have you know, a very um, big effect on us. If we can keep our thinking rational, then we can do something constructive about it. So we're always trying to tease out uh, is our thought rational or irrational, is matching reality or not matching reality. Importantly, when I'm working with clients, 99% of the time, the worries are not, don't come true. You know, they're, they're worrying about things uh, that aren't going to happen at the moment. Uh, probably yourselves, a lot of what you're worrying about is potentially true. You know, how are things going to be? When can we get back to normal? Am I safe when things get back to normal? Um, they're real thoughts and they're rational because there is uh, evidence to, to support those thoughts. But thinking, you know, constantly thinking, I'm never getting back to normal, it's going to be terrible, isn't helpful. So it's important to tease out, is it rational or irrational? But most importantly, is it helpful? Because sometimes we get very caught up with, is it true or false? And a thought can be true. If you're going 
uh, into hospital for a surgery and you start thinking about how painful it's going to be and how terrible you will feel immediately afterwards, you're right, it, it, you know, it will be painful and you will feel terrible, but focusing on that, does that actually help? And if you had a friend going for the same surgery, would you be saying to them, oh, it's gonna be really painful, oh, you're gonna feel terrible. And you go, no, I don't know, I wouldn't speak like that to somebody else. So have a think about what you're focusing on. Yes, that's true, but it's not helping. So a way that you would switch out of that is you would go, okay, yes, it's going to be painful, but it's getting this thing that's been hanging over me for ages. I'm finally getting the surgery and I'm going to feel so much better in the long run. So that's a more balanced thought. Um, I was explaining to the girls as well, I'm allergic to the think positive. Uh, you know, things, when things are difficult and you're dealing with a difficult situation, you know, nobody knows this better than you do. Um, to be told, you know, oh, chin up, it's not that bad. Oh, you know, that's so it's patronizing, it invalidates your experience. Um, life is not positive, life is full of challenges and stress and strains. And, uh, you know, we just we are always dealing with something. And I know that as a parent, I have two boys in college, they're both at home at the moment, so everything is very different and up in the air. And to say, you know, oh, think positive about COVID, COVID's not positive. You know, there's lots of positive things happening and people are trying really hard and there's lots of good stuff going on, but the situation is not positive. So let's not pretend and kind of try and placate ourselves. And you maybe have felt placated or, you know, spoken down to. Um, by, and people are well-meaning, you know, and they, they think we're being helpful, but I'm allergic. So I'm not, I won't be in the three part of there will be no mention of me thinking positive. So you can be reassured about that. Okay. Um, so I was thinking, talking there about the primitive brain and the opposite of the primitive brain or its kind of parent part is up here is called the prefrontal cortex. That's the thinking part. So if I said to all of you, what were you doing on the 2nd of January 2018? You would all go uh, and you'd go, we, if we shoved you all into MRI machines, you would see areas in the prefrontal cortex lighting up. And that's where the remember I said about the neurons firing the electrical activity it would be all up here. That's the mature part of the brain. Uh, that doesn't finish growing until we're about 25. So if there's anyone on who's under 25, you've got a bit of a, a free card because you're you're not working off. And both my sons are under 25, so they're always reminding me of that. That you know, we're not you're not playing with a full, you know, fully developed brain. Uh, and it's why they have in, in law the 18 rule for um uh, responsibility. So when we're anxious and afraid, guess what part of our brain is active? Primitive brain back here. It's the stress response. Uh, it's very basic. Like I said, it has a very narrow focus. Um, it's not taking in all the information. All it hears is the word threat and disaster. Um, and actually, they know this in Hollywood. Do you know, like in movies, I'm useless. For, I can't watch a horror movie if you paid me. But you know, like even in Jaws, Dun, 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 and the hairs go up the back of your head. That's Hollywood knows how we respond. We're tuned in for this. So um, that's that's the part anyway. That that's at work. It's it's scanning always. It responds really quickly. Uh, but it's like the toddler. It's really basic. It's stamping its feet, going I'm afraid, and it's not really taking in all the information. But when we stop and question our thinking, and we go, hang on. Is this a good idea to be thinking this thought? And we very rarely stop and do that. Guess which part of the brain, brain activates? It's up here. So what kind of questions? So you can see there on the left-hand side, this is another sheet that matches the thinking sins that I showed you there. So if you're having, you know, if your mental filter is one of your kind of ways of thinking that isn't helpful, it just gives you a few questions there to ask yourself. So, you know, judgments. We can be very judgmental. Oh, I did that job there. Oh, yeah, I didn't do it very well. Or, oh, I should have, you know, and we start making the judgment instead of just going, I did something. So you could ask yourself a few questions. I'm making an evaluation about the situation or person. It's how I make sense of the world. But that doesn't mean my judgment is always right or helpful. Is there another perspective? So just that pause, remember the loop? 
And I was saying, you know, the stress loop goes around and around and our thoughts feed our feelings and our behaviors and also our emotions. So if we can cut in, if we can stop and go, hang on a second now, think about that for a second. Is that helping me to think that? Would I speak to somebody else like that? If you engage that part of the brain, that stops that cycle literally in its tracks and that helps the brain, it helps the body then to relax physically. Okay, so is that clear? Um, just at this stage, has anyone any questions or any thoughts or any anything coming in, Nuala, that you can see? I don't want to be just keep speaking. Uh, if anyone, I, there's nothing on the chat here. Oh, right. Okay, folks, feel feel free if you want to ask anything or comment at any stage. Please do jump in at any point. Okay, so. I'm going to implant now somebody in your heads to help you remember to question your thoughts. Because if you're thinking something, you need somebody to go, hang on a second, can you prove that? Is that true? Is that rational? Is that helpful? Does everybody know this lovely lady? <laughs> like I, I do I do this in my with my clients and uh Everybody knows Judge Judy. It's it's mad. Like young fellas, young. I've had young lads, seventeen. Yeah, they know Judge Judy. Have men, they're sixty. Oh yeah, Judge Judy. Everybody knows her. I wonder she's. I think she's one of the highest earning people in TV in America. Good woman, Judge Judy. Anyway, she's now in your head. So the next time you have a thought, next time you have that knot in your stomach, you're oh god. You have to prove to Judge Judy that that thought is true, and not only that it's true, is it helpful, okay? So she's gonna be sitting there going, prove it, honey, not in my courtroom. And you know the way she's so, she's brilliant. I love her, she's just no crap about her at all. She cuts through and it's that kind of thing you want when your head is spinning, there's too much going on. You want a cold and a rational voice coming in going, stick to the facts as she does in her courtroom. What are the facts here? Let's think about helpful and true rational and helpful okay so judge judy is now in your heads so if anyone doesn't like her sorry <laughs> okay how do we know when we're stressed and i think this is very relevant for anybody who has an existing physical condition because it's our body that tells us when we're stressed we all when we're stressed the body releases the uh, hormone adrenaline because if you think of primitive brain, uh, this part of our brain goes back hundreds of thousands of years to Neanderthal man wandering around and uh, he had very little to do. He had to get food, he had to stay warm and dry, and he had to stay alive. That was about it. And reproduce. That, that was it in a nutshell. And adrenaline was what helped tell him when there was a threat. So he would have oh, not in his stomach, his heart rate would have been pounding, um, breathing would have been affected, dizzy head, you know, there's a lot of, of different ways. Um, my typical way uh, that I felt stressed, particularly when I was in college, was in my jaw. I would wake up, I'd be clenching my jaw in my sleep, and I would wake up literally kind of like almost in a locked jaw. And I had no idea if I'd known all this, I would have done something about it. But um Everybody has their own. So maybe just everyone think for a second, okay, what's my alarm bell? Think of it like an alarm bell. Because, and actually something that's uh, clients in the last two years, maybe three years, like when I started, it was, you know, it was these, stomach, my heart rate, maybe holding your breath. Um, but in the last two years, this people, a lot of people have described this kind of pressure in their chest, like a weight in their chest when they're anxious or when they're stressed. Um, and it's just, but it's, it's very um, strong. It's very striking uh, when they feel it. So it's really important. It's really good to know what's your signal. It's kind of like, imagine a toddler crying for your attention. And if you ignore it, what will the toddler do? It'll wail even louder. So it's really important to get to know what's your own individual um, sign or, or alarm bell and then pay attention to it as soon as you see that kick off. 
again, this is part of adrenaline, is the hormone that gets released when we're in fight or flight. But there's a third part to that that gets kind of forgotten. It gets ignored, the freeze. Um, if you think of an animal being hunted or chased, if it froze and there's some big, you know, a leopard or something chasing it, and it froze and hid, and gra you know, there was a chance that it would be, uh, a, you know, run over or missed. And lots of us go into freeze mode. And that was something, the reason I probably had locked you in college because I wasn't studying very well. I wasn't a good student at all, any students watching. Um, and I'd say, you know, I would kind of go, oh, I just pretend it's not, you know, that kind of switching out, pretending it's, you know, the thing isn't happening. I just put my head in the sand. And that's a kind of a freeze. That's again, a very um, deeply wired physiological response to stress, to thinking I can't manage this. I have too much I can do. So we need to be aware of when we're in fight or flight. And the way we do that is to tune in physically and get to know what's your first sign. So if you can check in over the course of the day, a couple of times a day, and just listen, how's my heart rate? How's my stomach? Have I not? Um, how's my breathing? And I know breathing is a separate issue for yourselves because that's one of your own issues with the CF. So breathing, but I'm sure you all still know within the condition when you're breathing, the stress breathing is different. Um, so if you're tuned in, uh, am I tense? Often at the end of a busy day, I'll end up with my shoulders up around my ears and I'm like, you know, I have to physically try and, you know, unwind. But if you're not tuned in, if you're not paying attention, you'll miss these signs and we just plow on then and keep going. And the cycle keeps kind of rotating. So a really nice grounding exercise. And the girls were saying, because usually we talk about breathing because it turns on the it helps us switch from fight or flight into rest and digest. And I go into the detail of all of that, which is really interesting uh, in the uh, other workshops, but just briefly. And she said, oh, look, it doesn't work with CF. It can activate, you know, can cause coughing and it just makes a bad situation worse. And that's really good to know. And that's really interesting learning for me. But we still need to be able to do something to help shift you from fight or flight into rest and digest, go from one nervous system to the other. And a really nice way of doing that is a grounding exercise. So when you find yourself, you know, kind of flapping and overwhelmed is to look around and do the five, four, three, two, one exercise. So if you can look around you and name five things. So even if you try and do it right now, I'm in my kitchen. So, okay, I can see five things and you would name them off. Then you would try and list four colors that you can see that you're looking at. Then can I hear three different sounds? Be the dripping tap, the clock ticking, and the dog is over the basket, I can hear breathing. So three sounds. And then can you describe two textures? Okay, so this is kind of silky, and I'm wearing jeans, and they're, I don't know, den, I just don't feel like kind of den me. So that's two textures. And then you say one word. So you have your own favorite word. For me, I like to say the word calm. Somebody might like to say strong. Somebody, if it's to do with yourselves and your condition, you might like to say well or healthy. You know, so you pick your one word. So that's a really nice exercise. I can write this out and send it to you guys if anybody wants it. Um, and as you're doing that, because when we're panicked and thinking what if and we're catastrophizing, our attention is gone off into the future. This is a nice grounding exercise. It brings you back into the present into the here and now because you're using all your senses so that sends a message back to primitive brain oh your one's counting things all right we must be grand i can down tools it's like primitive brain is kind of like a guard dog that's gone a bit rabbit you know it's he's overactive he's overexcited so you're trying to soothe down by dog down boy you're soothing by doing an exercise like that the listing looking around paying attention slowing you have to slow down to hear noises, to see colors, to name items. It helps calm everything. So that's a really nice exercise to do. If you ever come across somebody, just as an aside, um, who struggles with panic attacks, maybe, or you know, kids that get very, you know, hyper, um, that's a lovely grounding exercise. Say to them, okay, name, look around, name five things. Tell me five colors that you can see. 
listen to Theresa and you see you're using all the senses. So it's a really nice little exercise. So that's one to keep in mind as a grounding. It's a nice thing to do anyway, even if you're not stressed, to just kind of calm yourself and, you know, in, get more in touch with where am I right now? It brings you into the here and now. Okay, something to be aware of as well. If your heart's pounding out of your chest, if you've had maybe a fright or something bad has happened, it takes 20 minutes for adrenaline to work its way out of your system. That's the hormone. So once it's kind of out, you know, it has to work its way through your system. So it can be a really useful thing to do to go for a walk, burn off that energy, do something uh, constructive for those that 20 minutes. It won't even do a grounding exercise. You'll start to come back into the here and now. You'll start to feel better, but you might be still a little bit jittery for, you know, a few minutes. So don't uh, panic or be worried if that's what's going on. Okay. Act early. Why am I saying that? If you think of the loop, if you think of the cycle, often, you know, the first little, you know, oh, I don't feel, I feel a bit uneasy. And if you ignore that primitive brain, well, she's not listening. She's not aware of this threat or risk or whatever it is I'm worried about. It will release more adrenaline and it will keep releasing adrenaline until we do something. So the earlier you act and react, to a stressful situation, the better, the easier it is to manage. There's also a secondary cortisol. If you think back again to Caveman, Caveman is playing a big role here tonight. If you think back to Caveman, right, his job was go out, hunt, bring food back, chill, sleep, you know, rest and recuperate. So he was kind of on, but he only he didn't stay on in terms of fight or flight. He wasn't in threat mode all day long. At the moment, there is so much uncertainty. There is so much risk. We're in fight or flight almost constantly. And that's where we're being flooded with adrenaline. And the secondary hormone cortisol gets released then as a kind of a backup to help us manage this huge task. Cortisol is a normal hormone that would be released in the morning. It helps us kind of wake up. It gives us that extra boost of energy. And again, teenagers in sleep, their kind of levels are slightly different. So in the morning, normally we should have boost in the morning and cortisol should be tapering off all day long. And then when it hits a minimal level, that sends a cue that tells us it's time for bed or it's sleep time. So we start to kind of relax. If we're constantly nervous and anxious and panicked and worried, full of adrenaline and our cortisol is spiking all day long, that affects our ability to sleep. So it's really important, if we can, to try and manage, do the grounding, do the check-ins, act early, get in on this stuff and don't leave it ramble and kind of, it just ferments in the background, it doesn't go away. Okay, our actions are important as well in terms of mental health. Our activities, what we do, this is like the behaviors. How's your nutrition? No. I presume as people with, you know, a physical condition that you're all over this stuff, that you know this stuff down pat, you're already, you know, very careful about yourself and your, your health. Um, but sleep, you know, it must be difficult um, to sleep if you're really, um, if you, you're going through maybe a bad phase uh, in your condition um, or because of all the stress that's going on at the moment. Something to be aware of as well is caffeine in terms of energy drinks, uh, actual coffee, um, their stimulants. And if you're prone to worry or anxiety, the use of stimulants on top of that isn't great. Um, drugs and our use of them, and maybe even like, do we maintain um, our medications well? Are we over relying? You know, all kinds of stuff like that. You know yourselves what's good. And it's just, I would always say to people, just be aware of how you use things uh, they're just, they're easily available. And I think a lot of people are drinking a lot more at the moment. Uh, we're all stuck at home. We can't go out. And it's very easy to like have a glass of wine and another glass of wine. And next thing you know, the bottle is gone. And the fear that alcohol can, can bring in is, uh, you know, it's just, it's not a good idea. So it's just worth keeping in mind. Um, are any of those, have I any unhelpful habits in there? Because uh, it's just, we've enough on our plates at the moment. Do you exercise when you can? And I know, again, see if I eat fantastic resources and you have physiotherapists and you have yoga, all of that stuff is fantastic. And as much as possible, uh, exercise just has so many benefits. 
if you can. And these, none of these are solutions. None of these fix anything. Like um, in depression, we would try and use exercise a lot because of the natural endorphins boost that it, it gives. But people can get, oh, that's, you know, it's not as simple as that. And it's not. But if there is something that you can do that's completely free, it's going to help you uh, get over something, why not do it? Um, if there's people in your family that you'd like to be you know, exercising more, there's a brilliant video on YouTube, 23 and a half hours. It's only four or five minutes, but it's, it's absolutely worth looking at. There's a cardiologist and he talks through all the different benefits of exercise. Uh, really worthwhile to have a look at. Very important for um, either people with the condition or people caring for people with the condition. What do you do to recharge the batteries, to take time out, to take breaks? We're awful in self-care, I think, in this country. We, we keep going. We're martyrs. You know, um, I was reading a thing about um, nurses in the UK and PPE, and they're not getting enough and they don't want to complain. You know, patients first. And I mean, that's so amazing, but it is, you know, we have to put ourselves first. You can't pour from an empty jug. And we kind of go, oh no, I should be looking after everybody else. Uh, Self care, vitally, vitally important. Um, you know, we just, you'll, you'll run out, you'll burn out if you, if you don't mind yourself. And you're better off, you're better able uh, to be caring or care, you know, minding yourself physically if you take regular r and r we're not good at that so just these are kind of things just to keep in the back of your mind as a kind of a checklist um when there's something on your mind do you talk to somebody or do you hide it what do you like at asking for help like when i do these workshops um you know in a room with 100 people i would ask i would say okay um who here would help a friend if they knew they were in trouble, if they were struggling with something. And every hand in the room goes up and I say, hold on, keep your hands up. And then I say, okay, leave your hand up if you're good to ask for help when you need it. And like 90% of the hands come back down. And that may be a very particular issue um, with CF. If you have a physical condition where you're not always able and you have to ask for help more, you may be then reluctant to ask for help because you feel you're, oh, it's a burden, I'm guilty. And that's all the kind of stuff that I will go into uh, in the other workshops. Um, but that's just something, again, I'm kind of planting seeds. So I hope that you think about them and kind of go, yeah, maybe that's something now I could, I could have a look at. Biggest message, please don't ignore stress. Do not, with every stressful thought or situation, it is really important not to distract, ignore, avoid. It just builds and builds and builds. It doesn't get any better. You know, it becomes a much bigger issue. That if you can nip something in the bud, much, much better. So you get to know your sign, your alert button, or what, you know, what is that alarm bell saying? And you can react to it early. It's, it's far better. Because we're inclined to just kind of plod along, head in the sand, and just, or just, keep going and again it's the familiar we're used to doing that it's not again that we're deliberately um you know ignoring things but it can be just habits or it can be just the primitive brain going into freeze mode uh, and not helping okay something to think about is what we would call uh, the vicious cogs of stress if you think about cogs as a wheel sometimes we can do things that actually make it worse uh, instead of maintaining um, so something like uh, neglecting myself, like I was saying in the previous slide, you know, not giving, not taking time out, not um, resting, not maybe going to bed early when you need extra sleep, um, not eating, you know, maybe the healthiest of food, you know, uh, taking that kind of thing is really important. The distorted thinking, you know, underestimating. If I, I'm sure everybody in here tonight is you know has incredible determination resilience like strength because you have to deal with um you know so much extra that people without cf don't have to even think about you know and people say oh my god i don't know how you do it and i you know we have no choice we you know we really have to get on and manage very difficult situations people who are dealing with terminal illnesses and people who are suddenly bereaved 
you know, people say, oh my God, you're so amazing. I'd never be able for that. Like, you know, we just, we have to get on and do. And a lot of the time we're better able than we kind of give ourselves credit for. And that's where the kind of distorted thinking can come in. You know, where we're thinking, you know, I'm not able, I can't, you know, I can't deal with this. When in fact, I'm really actually very good at doing this. So have a think about, is there anything that you're doing that's maintaining your stress? Okay, mental overload. Is your head fried? Is there too much stuff on your mind? Uh, up to last week, if there was leaving through students, I'd say their heads were absolutely fried. Really important to write things down. Guess what part of the brain you're engaging, and I'll talk about that again in more detail. Um, list things. When I was in, uh, went back to do the uh, CBT, I'd like a massive file. I had so many things to do. It was just overwhelming. And I actually went and wrote down everything that I had to do. And then I was able to start ticking. There's nothing better than a checklist. Break things down. Dolly Parton is my absolute hero. One day at a time, dear Jesus, one thing at a time. So small. And I think for COVID as well, people are going, oh my God, what's going to happen in September? My son said last night, I'm going to be back in college in September. I was going, you know what? Let's not even go there yet because we don't know. Let's just deal with today and this week and right now. Because when we wander off like that into the uncertainty, suddenly we're stressed. We just have to chunk and do one thing at a time, small manageable chunks, and that helps put order. In terms of sleep, I'll be doing a whole section on that. Um, just, you know, you can Google sleep hygiene. Um, there's loads on that. I'm gonna fly through that. I'd say most of you probably pretty aware of the basics of that. And then an important thing to keep in mind is how we nourishing our minds daily. What are we looking at? What kind of fuel, what are we, you know, what are we paying attention to? Again, think about what the brain goes to. Uh, and a lot of the media, like good news doesn't really sell. They know that we respond faster to negative or you know, clickbait, like this kind of a headline. When I went searching, I said, oh, I find something like, look how ridiculous that is. Do you know, I go, what? You know, so we have to think about where are we getting our information from? A lot of people that I know, a lot of my clients have just stopped watching the news. They're just... There's just too much. It's over information overload at the moment. So think about where you're getting your information from and is it helpful? Is it, you know, rational and truthful? How we feed ourselves and how we speak to ourselves is really important. That's my lovely dog. She's sleep over. Be careful of how you speak to yourself. That's something, that inner voice, because you're listening. You know, we, we can be very harsh and, and kind of impatient with ourselves. A really good rule of thumb is if you wouldn't say to a friend, don't say it to yourself. If you think of that kind of rule, that helps. We're all, you know, be encouraging and supportive and kind. That's there, the kind of emotions that come up when we're in rest and digest when we're nice. We see what we decide to see. And like Sam and I were having a conversation earlier about cocooning and, you know, the different perspectives that you can take on that. Is that, you know, are people being mithered? Are they being, you know, thought of as, you know, can't mind yourselves? Or are they protected and, and cared for? So, you know, your perspective is completely, uh, that's something that you can control and that's something that you can choose how you see yourself. If you see yourself as capable, uh, you know, that's a top down, that sends a message down to the body. Yes, uh, you know, we can do this and that helps calm ourselves. So as you're looking at that slide there, what do you see? How many people can see an old lady? What do you see, Sam, young? I see, I see a young woman. Yeah. Looking away? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can everybody see the young woman? Yeah. Okay. It depends. There's two. The young woman is her chin. She's turned away. You can see her little eyelash and her nose. It's her profile. She's like this looking away. The older woman, the black line, which is the, um, it's like a ribbon tied around the young woman's neck. That's the mouth of the older woman and her neck is, that's, her chin. So there's two images in there. And the way, can you see the older one? Can you see the second yes. one, Sam? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, I can. 
it's just, just an it's, yeah and that's just an exercise to show how our brains we go for one thing first and then we we are much slower to shift off that once you see one the brain will stick a little and then some people learn you know and i've had works we can't they go i can't see the second one and we've had do you know quite interesting debates until everyone can see the two but it's just to remind ourselves it's not what we it's not the event mm. it's how we perceive it it's not what's in front of us it's what we're focusing on and i think that's quite relevant you know Lula was saying have you ever felt like defined by cf and at times when i'm sure it's flaring and it's all you can think of absolutely but how can I manage that? How can I rein that back in? How can I keep my thoughts in context, you know, for what's uh, going on? The bigger picture, I'm much more than my condition. I'm not only, you know, a sick person. I'm, that's, you know, a label I don't want. Okay, so the worry effect. When you're worrying about something, not doing anything, you're suffering twice. And that's when my son said, oh, we get back to college. I said, please, you know, there's absolutely no point even going there. We have no idea. We can't go any further than we have the information we have at the moment because they're literally, they're having to see is everybody staying, doing what they're meant to be doing. And it seems the figures are really low tonight now, the, the lowest in a long time. So, you know, going off into conjecture, it means you suffer twice because your brain will go as if the thing you're saying is true. It will react. Primitive brain doesn't know if you're imagining or actually experiencing it. Because if you go out to cross the street and there's, you know, a car quipping towards you, and if your prefrontal cortex hopped in and went, oh, is that a car? I wonder, should I jump? You know, it would be too late. Primitive brain, act first, think later. So it doesn't really weigh things up. Whereas... When it comes yeah. to imagining a situation, it will react as if the situation is real. So that's why it's really important to watch for worry. And I do a lot on that in the uh, workshops. So overview, thoughts, what are they? Mental fart, electrical impulse. Sometimes the less attention we pay to them, the, the better. How we think when we're stressed and anxious, those thinking sins can come to play. Cognitive distortions, spotting when we're stressed, really important. Tune in, pay attention to your body. What to do, do the grounding exercise, identify the thought. Would I say that to a friend? That can be really helpful. We want to try and move from problem describing to problem solving. So rather than talking about how bad something would be, let's say, can I prepare it? I was doing work with the uh, Chamber of Commerce, helping people with um, businesses to engage because some of the businesses were like head in the sand, don't want to think about it. And the Chamber of please, come and engage we have loads of resources there's things we can be doing there's grants there's all kinds of things uh put business online or whatever you know get active get stuck in rather than sitting in the stress without doing anything um to fix it so that's a big part can i move from problem describing and then the weekly habits that i kind of threw out there things for you to think about um in terms of kind of physical as well as mental health they have a very reciprocal uh, they they work both ways in terms of you know sleeping and food and fuel and what you're listening to and paying attention to how you're talking to yourself they're all really important as well so in the three parters we're going to the anxiety and stress in a bit more detail a little bit of neuroscience how our brains work a few really nice little clips and videos on that um part two just for yourselves like the impact emotionally of living with a long-term physical condition. You know, what ways, what are the typical impacts that can have and how can you manage them best? And then I go into quite a bit on sleep and managing sleep and a good healthy daily routine that helps with sleep. There's a couple of steps in there. Um, what's that guy's, Matthew Walker wrote this book on sleep in the last two years and it's been, you know, huge uh, top seller. And in it, in that book, the only thing he recommends for sleep is CBT. And I have done the CBT, CBTI, it's called CBT for insomnia. And I've done that training. I don't do the whole thing, but I will have really good pointers for that in part two. Then in part three, communication, you know, managing uh, stress within families or couples, partnerships, uh, siblings. How do I talk to people? How do I mind myself? Boundaries, stuff like that. Resilience. 
bounce back a lot of i'm sure a lot of you already have incredible resilience but are you aware of it can it be boosted what kind of things matter when it comes to uh, resilience and how can it be improved and then just general uh, covid mindset management going forward by the time we get to part three hopefully we'll know a lot more there'll be a couple of weeks time um, and like I said uh, at the start there, I'm really open to information, queries, suggestions, feedback, and then in particular that maybe you don't see here that you'd like to see here. I'd be really keen to um, really kind of personalize the uh, content for yourselves. So that's me, guys. Um, summarizing, check in regularly, know your alert signs, tune in if it's a rational part. Plan. If it's a rational thought, it's real. Yeah, I need to do something. Okay, have you an action plan? And I have sheets for that. If it's irrational thought, we change the thinking. And I'll show you how to do that. Activities. Are my behaviors helping me or hindering me? And that's the stuff I was doing there. Have you a plan? Write it down. Make it easier. And then your mind is a muscle. That's the bit around the neuroscience and neuroplasticity that we talk about. How we literally can reshape our brains by doing CBT exercises and techniques. Okay.